How you doing? Pretty good. Just got in from South Carolina? That's right, yeah, yeah. we were uh, doing uh, uh, the march uh, on the Capitol. We do one in South Bend, but it's a little different when you're uh, in the footsteps of those who, with a similar march not long ago, helped bring the Confederate flag down from over the Capitol in South Carolina. So uh, it was so you, a good so morning. You were just in march on Capitol in South that's right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. You, so we were you, moving around quickly. That's yeah. how it works moving when you're running for president. To all the Kim folks and all the brown and black folks, this is, this is the tour. That's right. Yeah. So I want to jump right in because we only yeah. have a little bit of time with you. So while we've observed your efforts to reach out to black communities, better get to know black voters, we've noticed that, at least in public, you spend a fair amount of your time with black male elders. You got in lunch with Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Reverend William Barber. And... We're curious about it because you are by far the youngest candidate, the only gay candidate. Why not prioritize young and black voters first or black and queer organizations? Well, well we're trying to reach out to everybody where they are. Now, uh, when I meet, for example, with uh, black queer faith leaders in Texas, it doesn't get as much nationally televised attention as when I sit down with uh, the Reverend Allen in Harlem. Uh, I'm going to do both, and I'm going to engage everybody that we can, whether it's here in Iowa, uh, where uh, there are so many black and brown folks doing remarkable work, whether it's in the South, whether it's in the kind of familiar stops, or whether it's off the beaten track. Also, some of the engagement we do isn't made for TV, because sometimes I've got to be more in receive mode than transmit mode. But we work everywhere we go to have smaller conversations where we're really not just sharing my case for why I believe I ought to be president, but making sure that we've taken on board the concerns of the people we're speaking to. So in the last nine months to a year, what have you learned about black people? Well, first of all, a level of frustration and a fear of, uh, or, or a, a, an exhaustion, I guess, with being taken for granted. Now, this is not new for me to see because this is something that uh, black folks in my city are experiencing too. But when you meet someone through the prism of being a presidential candidate, especially a new on the scene, young, white presidential candidate talking about big ideas, rolling out something like the Douglas plan saying, trust me, you see just how much frustration and pain is beneath the skepticism that a lot of people have who but want been, to know. Not it hasn't just been what, a secret, though, that your campaign has struggled a bit and has made some stumbles along the way. So what have you learned? Like, are there things that you've learned about the black community, their needs, their concerns that maybe surprised you or you got wrong at first? Well, I think, uh, again, first of all, the sense that there is frustration with us Democrats, not just with Republicans, that there's a sense even now when you look, especially in the South, where black women have been the backbone of the party's ability to win anywhere, uh, that there is still not a lot of attention being paid. I mean, we could talk about policy areas where it, I've learned a lot. For example, uh, I knew about the numbers of uh, what's going on with the black maternal mortality gap, but it was really from uh, listening a lot to the people I've encountered that I got a better sense of how those disparities have come about and what's at stake, uh, how it's everything from the way the patients are being treated uh, when they're in a clinical environment, to things that happen before they even cross the doors of an ER. I've learned that uh, there is a necessity before anyone cares about what's in your plans to convey what's in your heart. So I've worked to do that. Um, sometimes taking some political risks to do it, um, but believing that it's the best chance I have to make sure that folks know why I care enough to care about what's in my plans. Actually, you brought up maternal mortality, um, which I want to follow up on. A member of our audience actually just asked a question about that. What can a president do about the fact that when you actually drill down in the data, a lot of what appears to be happening is purely individual racist incidents. Mm -hmm. a, doc a white doctor looking at a black woman on a table and saying, I'm just not going to work as hard for you today. And coming into the room with some stereotypes. How do you legislate against that? How do you fight that from the office of the president? Well, you fight it, first of all, by making a health equity strategy at the centerpiece of how your administration handles health. I'm proposing that we supercharge the office of health equity and justice, have that in HHS, but also have it in every department that has any bearing on health. We've got to train doctors and clinical staff who are exhibiting uh, I mean, if it's explicit bias, then we need outright enforcement, right? We also need to tackle... Is the enforcement kinds of, removal from their jobs? We, I mean, yeah, if you are racist, if you are nakedly racist, then you have no business being in charge of being in care of anybody. 
But also, we got to recognize that there are institutional patterns of racism. Uh, we got to make sure that people are alert to the extent to which, for example, a black patient describing being in pain is less likely to be believed. And we got to find out how much that's been internalized, perhaps even sometimes by staff of color, which is why making sure that we have more diverse clinical staff, training and educating more black doctors, nurses, and practitioners is necessary, but not sufficient. We've got to make sure we're dealing with things like environmental injustice that help propel this, right? Again, before you even get to the clinical environment, the fact that you may have been redlined into a neighborhood where there's more contamination uh, or more air pollution, we've seen the statistics on things like asthma and how much more of a threat that is to black and brown children, uh, means that we've got to be acting literally on the, the safety of where you live. I mean, look no further than Flint where children are being poisoned, not only uh, as a consequence of racism in something like a medical system, but in the setup of the entire environment in which they live. So my point is that this is systemic. The harm is systemic. The racism is systemic. Therefore, the solutions have to be systemic. But so many of them can be acted on using the powers of the presidency, using the powers of the presidency to make sure that health equity is a responsibility in the Department of Housing as well as in the EPA, as well as in the department that's officially in charge of health, and making sure that through legislation as well as administration, and frankly, culture, having a president who's going to talk about these things is needed in order to make any progress. I want to talk about another systemic issue. Mm. The number of black police officers serving mm. in South Bend cut in half while you were in office in spite of diversity initiatives. You've been at the center of scandal around the demotion of the first ever black police chief, Chief Daryl Boykins. A recent Root and Young Turks investigation found that black police officers working in South Bend repeatedly reached out to your office to discuss systemic racism and didn't receive a response. Why didn't you meet with those officers? And what exactly did you know about the racism they faced mm -hmm. while they were serving? So first of all, I met and spoke with black officers all the time. Now, it is true that sometimes when an individual officer, often as a consequence of being disciplined, was uh, appealing to the mayor's office and trying to go around a process uh, that we asked them to respect a process. How does that process work? Well, we have a board that is appointed that makes decisions about hiring and firing and discipline. I directly appoint that board, and I saw to it that that board not only was diverse, but actually majority African American, because these racial questions are so important. I get a lot of questions about why I removed a black police chief. Almost never do I get a question about why I appointed a black police chief in the first place. Uh, it was largely because of his expertise and strength when it came to community policing. But when federal investigators came to South Bend and were investigating practices in the department, and I did not find out from him, that changed our relationship and changed my ability to have him in the role that he was in. Look, this is a painful issue in our city, and this is a painful issue in every city, but when we're dealing with it in our community, it's not from the luxury of a committee room. We're not debating these things in the abstract. We're dealing with them. And on my watch, in our city, we led the region in transparency on information about what was happening in policing. For example, publishing data on the use of force down to the incident level. And that's part of why use of force went down on my watch. I we acted there. to make sure that we had that kind of diversity on the board that was in charge. We so, acted to make sure that community activists were empowered in helping change the policies on how policing works. We didn't get it perfect, but we have had to face these issues on the ground and we got results to show for it. Simple question, Mayor. Well, yeah. There are fewer black office, officers working in the department than before you were hired. Yeah. Why is that the case? Well, this is an area where I've admitted we're not where we want to be. I'll tell you what we did about it. We worked to make sure there were more programs working with high schools and uh, where we had young people who would cultivate an interest in policing. We mapped out the application process to look for areas where there might be a disparate effect. Uh, and we conducted outreach in the community to make sure we were asking more people to be part of the solution. And now we started to see some activists who were largely coming at the conversation originally out of concern, some even willing to apply themselves. But clearly it hasn't happened nearly enough. And this has been a challenge for departments, especially post-Ferguson, around the country. I get so that the there's a challenge where, for departments and there's tons of processes and different boards that people need to move yeah. through. But some of this does seem pretty simple. Ten officers in June of 2014 sent a letter to the Common Council asking that they investigate. They didn't receive a response. Starting in August, numerous police officers reached out on an email to your office, specifically your office, 
asking for a public meeting. They didn't even receive a response, something saying, hey, you have to take this other process, go through this link, call this other person. They didn't receive a response. That seems like a very simple thing that you could have done to address their concerns. So again, we're in contact with officers a lot. And some of these involve cases of officers who were being disciplined or uh, being uh, experiencing uh, issues around uh, alleged officer misconduct on their part. I'm not going to get into all of the details because a lot of times of, when that Are you happens, saying half of all black police officers serving at the time had maybe done some kind of misconduct? No, and, and I'm not going to get into the case by case. What I am going to say is that when somebody threatens to sue you, you make sure they're talking to a lawyer. But you couldn't e have even set up a meeting with them to just hear it. I have had countless meetings with officers, including officers of color in our city. All right. I want to move on to the next question. We only have a little bit of time left. <laughs> You released a mental health care plan mm. with a focus on addiction and deaths of despair. So I want to ask you about two key groups at risk. Mm. A recent study found that from 2001 to 2017, the rate of death by suicide for black boys ages 13 to 19 increased by 60 percent. The rate for black girls, 182 percent. A separate study found that over half of trans male participants had attempted suicide at some point in their lives, just under 30 percent of trans women. What do you think is behind those numbers? And what exactly will your plan do for black children and trans people specifically? Well, I think what's behind it is the crisis of exclusion that we're experiencing as a country. And that's happening in institutional ways. People being harmed directly, whether it's institutional racism, whether it's this president's war on trans Americans, on everything from uh, telling them they can't serve in uniform to making it harder for a trans student to do something as simple as use a bathroom in a school. There's this sense of being under attack. There's a sense of pressure and weight. And if you were at the intersection... So hold on, just, if I can interrupt, we only have a few more minutes left, yeah. right? We understand the problem. Uh -huh. You don't have to explain the problem, uh -huh. but... The, the okay. question I was is, just trying to answer you, the question no, about my view of how it came about. Right, but what, what will you do? About yeah, okay, so we got the You Belong Mentorship Program. That's one thing that I think needs to get into the schools because it's often at that young and vulnerable age that these, these issues kick in, that people feel that pressure. It's having a president who tells trans Americans that they are supported, who lifts up things like the invisibility far too often of the crisis of violence against black trans women that I also think affects the mental health. Do you think the president has made young kids of color and transgender people, do you think it's, he's made their mental health worse? No question. No question. When, when you believe the leader of your own country doesn't see you or doesn't want you to succeed, of course that is bad for your health. But let's not pretend that if we, when we, replace this president, that everything's just going to get better. Because a lot of these problems have been mounting for a long time. Some of these problems are as old as the racism woven into the American story itself. So, so just to make sure I'm, I'm working through the solution yes. side, this is part of what that Office of Health Equity Justice I'm talking about is going to work on. Also, we've got to put some dollars, some concrete resources into this. That's why I'm proposing what we're calling healing and belonging grants that go into community efforts that are making sure that our youth, and especially our most vulnerable youth, are lifted up. This is also why people need to see people like them in positions of authority. And whether we're talking about in a school building, you know, uh, if I got my numbers right, the most diverse teaching staff of any district in, this, in anywhere in Iowa is 92% white, the most diverse one. We can use funding through a program called Title II to make sure that we are building the diversity in the teaching and administration staff uh, of the first authority figures that many uh, of these young people will encounter, in addition to making sure that we got an administration that reflects the diversity of America. So some of it's concrete funding for interventions, some of it's representation, and some of it is the culture that we send from the highest office in the land. I'm going to try to squeeze in one last really quick question. Mm -hmm. You've stopped short of embracing student debt cancellation and making public college free for everyone. Your plan does make public college tuition free for households about $100,000 and below. But in many communities, $100,000 doesn't actually go super far. And for black and brown families who generally have less access to generational wealth, home ownership, investments, could that cut off sting? No, I mean, this is why we're being intentional about making sure the resources go to where they're needed. First of all, let's be clear. What I am talking about is the biggest expansion in college affordability in modern history. Now, if you're making more than 100,000 bucks, I need you to pay at least some of your own tuition. But we also have other forms of support. Pell Grants, 
making sure that we are supporting uh, living expenses for students, and knowing that black and brown students are more likely to be, for example, expected to support family measure, members because of that issue of generational wealth. It's why, as part of our Frederick Douglass plan to dismantle uh, systemic racism, we're looking at supporting entrepreneurs who go on to create jobs for others with a debt for jobs program. In other words, if, if you emerge from college, you've got that degree and you do have college debt and you're creating opportunity for others and you are Pell eligible, we make sure that uh, we remove that debt too. Of course, you can already get public service loan forgiveness, but right now the program is terrible. It's almost impossible to take advantage of. We're going to make it more generous. We're going to make it more user friendly. All of these steps taken together are designed for this purpose, to make sure that cost is never a barrier to being able to go to school. But let's also remember that what a lot of folks, especially a lot of first generation and especially a lot of black and brown students are up against is that they don't uh, get a chance to complete college. The worst shape you could be in is debt but no degree. And that's why we've got to deal with the barriers, including financial barriers like the cost of living that the Pell Grants are supposed to help with, uh, that make it that much harder for the students who hold the promise of being the next generation of black doctors who aren't going to make these mistakes in the ER and, and black law enforcement leaders who are going to uh, lead law enforcement with a heart for justice uh, and, and black presidents who, who are going to uh, allow young people to see something different when their mental health is under pressure from the racism that they face, that that begins with our ability to create those educational opportunities and make sure they're actually succeeding in completion. Thank you, Mayor. Um, right now, we're gonna take a couple questions from the audience. All right. Paula? Hi, Mayor. So Hi. we have Leslie. She's a student from Des Moines. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm actually studying pre-law and political science at Grandview University. So I just wanted to know, Going back to what happened a few weeks ago in Iran, I just mm. want to know if you would have done something differently, and if so, what, what is it? Yeah, I would have done a whole lot of things differently. <laughs> I mean, look, I think about this from the perspective of having been sent to war by the orders of a U.S. president. And I know how important it is that we have a president who can be counted on to make those decisions, to make those decisions well. Now, to believe this was a solid decision, you want to believe certain things are true, that the president paid attention to all of the intelligence and carefully read it. <laughs> that the president consulted with any allies who might be impacted, especially allies like the government of Iraq who is hosting our troops, where it is very important that we have a relationship because that's a life or death question. That you would believe that the president didn't view this as a partisan issue and was talking to other leaders like leaders in Congress from the Democratic and Republican Party. And that above all, that the president thought about every move and counter move, every consequence of this decision. Does anybody really think that's what Donald Trump did in this case? There's no way. And what we see now is our country is even closer to the brink of war. And there is no evidence that our country is any safer. Look, I will not hesitate to use whatever means are necessary to keep the American people safe. But we just haven't seen, they can't even keep their story straight. We have seen no evidence that that decision was made the right way. And when I think about my friends, getting ready to deploy one more time right now and completely willing to do it because that's part of the deal when you raise your right hand. I know that they and their families deserve a president who is going to think before there is an action and is always going to act with their interests at heart. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question for you. Um, Chris, if you want to stand up. So Chris is a political organizer from Chicago. Thank you. Um, Mayor Buttigieg, my question is more about uh, Trump's economy and this possible Trump recession that's coming. Hmm. We talk about uh, college educated students, 70% of them upon graduation will be automatically in debt. Yeah. There was a recent money article two weeks ago that said that Chicago where I'm from is one of the least prepared for the recession. Right. I need to know what my presidential candidate and future president will do to prepare America for this Trump recession. Yeah. So even now, even before the recession that sooner or later will come, we're being told the economy is great, right? Just look at the Dow Jones, he says. And meanwhile, a lot of folks, disproportionately black and brown folks, aren't seeing that fantastic economy get to them. A lot of our communities aren't seeing that fantastic economy get to us. I believe we're counting the wrong things as a country. Right now, they measure the success of the economy based on the stock market and maybe based on the GDP. When I'm president, we're going to measure it based on the income growth of the 90%. In other words, it's a good economy if it's getting to more of us. 
And we're going to pay attention to the inequalities within that economy. So that whether the GDP is going up or down, whether we're technically in an expansion or recession, the thing we're focusing most on is, did you get a raise? And if you got a raise, is it as fast as the raise in the price of education, of health care, of long-term care, of saving for retirement, of housing, all the things we need in order to get by? In order to prepare, we need to make sure that people have savings and income that you're able to succeed with. And we know right now, even in a, an allegedly great economy, that that's not happening. I'm going to make sure that we have policies. Let me just mention one other thing. They talk about all this stuff going on in the economy like it's the result of some mysterious cosmic force. Uh, that, that we have the inequality that we do. It's the result of decisions, specific decisions that were made in Washington, like refusing to raise wages and making it harder for people to organize and organize labor, just to take two examples. If we make different decisions, we're going to get different results, and we'll get an economy where more of us can thrive, no matter what's happening to the numbers on a page. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Also, take it back. Yes. All right. Mayor Buttigieg. Join us back here. <laughs> <laughs> so one more thing before you leave. Huh? We have a segment that we call, wait for it, the short answer. Oh. Mm -hmm. You're going to try to get me to give short answers, huh? Yeah. Yes. Right. yes. Speed round. Let's see what we can do. Speed round. <laughs> yeah. You have 60 seconds to answer as many questions as possible. Okay. You can get a pass if you want to use it, but the audience Only will one judge pass. you. Yes. Is there a prize? Uh, a standing you, ovation, maybe. You might maybe. become president. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. Let's try it. Are you ready? All what right. I'll ever be. If Antonia and I invited you to a potluck or barbecue, what are you bringing? Oh. Is it a breakfast potluck? See, no. you already no. messing up. Like 4 p.m. Right? No it's going to be chips and salsa. I just, I just, okay. Mm. Flying or teleportation? Uh, flying, because you never know it's going to be the same you that gets... You messing up the short answer already. Flying, <laughs> flying, flying. How do you prefer your grits, sugar, salt, or cheese? Cheese. What are some of the blackest cities in America? Like by population? Yeah, just list off a couple. Yeah, uh, New Orleans, Washington, D.C. That's why Washington, D.C. ought to be a state, by the way, with a senator. But oh I know short answers. Short answers. <laughs> he is not good at short answers. <laughs> Go ahead. What song do you know all the words to? Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> uh, where did MLK go to college? Uh, Morehouse. Yes. Popeyes or Chick-fil-A? Popeyes. <laughs> what will be the largest minority voting bloc this election? Uh, people with disabilities. Are audiobooks reading? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. If you, if you bought my audiobook, then, uh, <laughs> then I support How do you think the mayor did, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, you did pretty good. Thank you yeah. very much, right. Mayor. Thanks Peter very much. Jay. Good to be with you. Thank you.